Hi, and welcome to another episode of Walleye Chronicles, where I get you guys off the street, bring in here to sit down next to me and talk about how you grew up fishing and how it's changed your life. This week, I have Daryl Christensen with me. If you guys are a fan of H2H, you guys know this man, you've listened to his stories already, but we're going to get a little more in depth with Daryl today. Daryl, how you doing? I'm doing great. How nice you to doing, meet Dad? you. Um, so let's start. Where'd you grow up? Grew up in Montello, Wisconsin, on the Fox River. Nice. The same Fox River that flows through Winnebago. Yep. So what's your, so your Montello, uh, what do your folks do for a living? Oh, my, my dad was, uh, he was kind of a jack of all trades for a while, but uh, he loved to fish. And, and we lived right on the river, so we could just walk out the back door and fish, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, so that's kind of how things started and eventually became postmaster and of, of the little town there. And, uh, yeah. Nice. So what's your first memory of fishing? Oh, boy. Uh, probably three four years old i would say uh, fishing bluegills yep you know behind the house and and being really uh jealous of my dad catching walleyes you know <laughs> that didn't take that didn't last long no so when did you <laughs> so when did you get to come with him in the boat when did you w wiggle your way in there yeah when i was five uh i caught my first walleye okay uh fishing with him I badgered him to the point, and, it, and all I had was a cane pole with, uh, you know, 12 feet of line on it yep. and a little cat gut, and my dad made streamer flies. That okay. was a real popular way to fish him. It still is yep. up here, and uh, um, he says, just throw this over the side and just keep yanking the rod like that till you feel something pulled back. Well, I caught a three-pounder nice. on it, and... Boy, and that was it. I was done. <laughs> <laughs> was that, were you in a boat or offshore? We were actually on shore okay. at that time, yeah. Uh, yeah, the river up there is quite quite good. I mean, I know it from my childhood a little bit, but I didn't live in the town. So right. how, so as you progressed, when did you get to kind of fish by yourself? Uh, yeah, probably uh, about the time they invented uh, uh, Zebco 33s. Yep. <laughs> you know, a little close face reel. They're, actually, they're Zebco 101s. They had a one-to-one one -one gear ratio. Yep. And uh, you, you'd grind the gears out of them in about two weeks <laughs> if you fished a lot, you know. And So we fished carp and catfish all summer and walleyes in the spring and fall uh, with those. And I'm seven, eight years old, uh, I would get up at 3 a.m. and go fishing. And Jeez. Uh, Who's right behind the house? Why so early? Well... Just because I was so eager to get out there, you know, and, and they, you know, when you're a kid, you know, they make you go to bed early, eight yep. o'clock, nine o'clock, whatever, and and so I've always only needed six hours of sleep a night, <laughs> and I'm still there. <laughs> so, um, so did you have friends that kind of went with you, or do you have a there's a there's a pack of Montella boys that were out there causing harm to the the waterway? Well, I had a neighborhood friend, Russ Gray, and uh, he was my age, so we fished together a lot. We would have contests who would <laughs> catch the most walleyes in the summer and that kind of thing. But we fished together a lot and uh, did through pretty much our whole lives. Any trouble getting in any trouble in the early days? Always, you know. <laughs> uh, but you know, my trouble. My, my dad worked out of town. I'd get up at three, go fishing, uh, come up for breakfast, go back fishing. And my mother would always said, now you'll be home by dark. So, well, in the summer, that's 9.30. Yep. So I'd be gone from 3 a.m. till 9.30. Wow. I'd pack a sandwich and just go down on a <laughs> river and fish. And I did it day after day after day. Was it the same spots or are you moving around? I'd move around. I'd, you know, in the summer jump in the river yep. and find all the deep holes find out <laughs> you know uh that's old that's old school uh a fishing locator there you exactly just, just yeah. walk to you yeah. disappear yeah. well you found where the clam beds were and yep. the, the rocks and all that and uh realize that that's where walleyes like to hang out and i i know it was well before you know i was 10 you know right. so a lot younger and pulling catfish out from underneath the, the bank <laughs> noodling <laughs> yeah noodling that's fun you know wow so is there any um there was a dam there right there yeah was a dam there. it was a dam there so any fun so you had the 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 uh the walleye run coming up to you basically right the walleye run would come up and they couldn't get any further that uh, there was no fish ladder there there is today yep. but there wasn't then and they'd be in there by the thousands in the spring and people that was before people really knew how to catch walleyes yep. very well but they were so thick a lot of those fish got foul hooked and yep. um but we would fish them 
you know, jigs were just being invented. Mm -hmm. uh, you could only get pink and white or pink and yellow. It's only two <laughs> colors, bucktails. Uh, so, where did you, you? So, was there a store in town? I know they have a holidays now, but was there something there that you could buy from? At the there time? was. My grandfather had a bait shop right below the dam, and we would uh, we would make jigs and sell them to him. And then at night we'd go back out into the river and wait around to find all the jigs that were lost and <laughs> clean them up and resell them. You know, it worked really great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it worked great for him too. He had an endless supply, and there was another guy in town that started making them. So, uh, and they're you know crazy stuff. Three quarter ounce. Right. You know. Uh, I suppose the, the mold pulls though. <laughs> you know, four to five inch bucktail on them, you'd catch you know eighteen inch walleyes on them. Um, you know, everybody went went to finesse after that, but mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you didn't have to. Was a lot of people fishing back then? During the walleye run, yeah, it would get pretty crowded for a few days and nights, but that generally, in summertime, nobody. And yeah. the river was still full of fish. All yeah. the post-spawn fish were still there. And so you had to run the whole way. Had to run, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So were you guys keeping them to eat or throwing yes. them back mostly? On, in those days, nobody threw fish back, believe <laughs> of any kind, <laughs> you know, uh, bass or anything. Every fish got got kept you know and of course you had your possess we had seven kids in the family so oh, we you had to catch we would eat fish every couple of days is that and so do you have brothers and sisters that were with you down there or were you pretty I, much I the fisherman i did but they weren't into it like i was and they would get bored and then they finally quit going so <laughs> i was pretty much kind of a loner or my buddy would come along and fish with me that's yeah. cool um so when did you first get into a boat um, my grandfather built boats okay. and rented them out on the river. And when they got to the point where they were too dangerous to, to rent out, he would give them to me. <laughs> You'd so, finish them off? Or? <laughs> so I, I would I would fix them up any, any way I knew how. But they still leaked, but you have a built-in live well. You know, the boats were uh, 18 feet long, wow. all wood, and they were rowboats. Yep. Uh, and I could just roll from the house to the dam. It's only a couple hundred yards anchor up and catch all the walleyes you wanted all day long uh, and then you threw you heavy boats oh they were re really heavy and you just threw the fish in the bottom of the boat and when they started to bite <laughs> your ankles you knew you, all the day. you need to get back and bail the boat out so you couldn't take that boat look i mean getting that boat in and out of the water must have been a pain it was hard uh, 18 foot's a big boat for yeah. up there oh general. yeah yeah they, they were they were heavy and they're you know all wood of course and but once you you know i, I would just stick uh, little sticks in where the leaks were oh, yep. and, and tar, you know, whatever you had, you know, to, to keep them from leaking. But they always leaked. Right. How was rowing that thing? It was hard. I I would go from the river downstream. I would take clients out. Yep. Now, I was guiding when I was 10. Wow. Okay. So I would take clients out, and we would drift down with the current mm -hmm. and then go down to where the Montello River comes into the Fox, the confluence there, and then catch northerns and bass in there, yep. kind of cleaner water, and then roll them back. Well, rowing against the current was, was wow. tough. And a wood boat. And, uh, but, hey, man, it was 5 bucks a day, <laughs> you know. <laughs> per person or per boat? For... No, no, for the boat. That's, well, I suppose back in the day. That's a pretty five, good day. 5 bucks a day. What did you and, spend that money on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I bought fishing Is rods and reels with it because uh, I would burn out, a like I said, a reel every couple of weeks. I, I fish a lot of carp and catfish, sold them to the people that came up from Milwaukee yep. in Chicago. So I would sell uh, fish to them. and But the... But those reels, I mean, <laughs> plastic gears, I mean, okay. they, they just dissolve in your hand, yep. you know, fishing those big fish. So what got you guiding? Who pushed you? Was it your grandpa that kind of, hey, uh, this kid can take you up there? Well, people, yeah. Well, people asked, you know, they said, yeah, we got somebody, because they didn't want to have to roll and yep. they didn't, didn't want to do the work. And they said, oh, my, my grandson, he'd do it, you know, you got to pay him. <laughs> and of course, I don't know, five bucks don't sound like a lot, but probably in those days, yeah, you know, it'd be maybe 50 now. Right, probably. What's the, what was the limit back then? I don't know. <laughs> There's a limit. <laughs> no, the limit. The limit well, was it's this big. That's the limit. The limit was always five. Yeah. And it was 15 inches for walleyes. Uh, bass uh, was five, but no size limit. And, and pike, same way. Yep. Five, but no size limit. Yep. Um, so you go out and just whatever you can catch, just fill the boat for them, basically. Yeah, they would. They just you know 
and mainly they fish top water stuff because they could and you know fish it decent and they just had a blast that's fun so is there any any of typical or any ones that stick out in your head or any any people you had when you're that young that just kind of still think of well i remember uh a, a woman i falling out of the boat and i had to rescue her because she didn't know how to swim <laughs> and uh of course i yelled to the, the, the people in the boat throw out the anchor <laughs> you know <laughs> so they threw out the anchor and i jumped in and uh i said you're gonna be okay i got you i got you and the water was like two feet deep <laughs> Put your feet down. she was splashing all over the place i didn't you know think was he I don't think it's that deep right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that. And I had to do that a few times below the dam where they would fall in. Yep. Or, but there was a lot of giant carp and catfish in there in those days. And a lot of times they'd fish. My grandpa had piers there, and they'd fish off those piers. And they'd set the hook, and the fish would yank them off the pier. And they'd go into the water. And, and there it was deep. There was 10, 12, 15-foot holes in there. And an undertow because the roller dam. So oh, yep. I would dive in and drag him to shore. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the. So it's like the lifeguard. Your <laughs> lifeguard. Yeah. So how long did that go on? That go on pretty much the whole time you 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 lived in. It Ontario? did. Uh, you know, through my teen years, and uh, you know, then of course my my grandfather sold it, and then he passed away. You know how, how things go in life, but uh, I go down and I still fish there. You know, <laughs> I'll I'll be fishing there in October because. We get a run of walleyes yep. in, and I just fish off the bank where I fish with my grandpa. Last place I fished with my dad before he passed away, and so uh, it's right down to the right down to the dam there. And yeah, a lot of memories. Just stand on the rocks and cast into the current, and That's nice cool. to have the nicer equipment though. Right, I bet. Yeah, it's a little. What would it have been like if you could have, if you could take what you got now and go back? Oh my goodness! When you were ten. <laughs> I mean, you know. It, you know, we obviously th that's the whole story nowadays is is how f advanced things have become, and and people are concerned that you're going to catch more fish. But uh, we, we caught plenty. Yeah. I mean, we we caught way more than you could ever imagine. And uh, you know, an interesting thing about that is I I see people. I go down there quite a bit, and I see people fishing. They got a bobber, you know, this big around. It's like a watermelon. <laughs> And, and they got a hook on there and they're trying to catch bluegills. You know, so people, even with all the knowledge and all the yeah. equipment and everything else, they still, there's still a need for people to teach them how to catch fish and yeah. how to, how to you know, use that equipment yeah. properly. Yeah. It's, it seems if we miss a, if somebody misses a generation in their family, it's tough for that family to get back to fishing That's without right. somebody tr teaching them how to fish. Exactly. So you did that up into your teens. How was high school? Did um, you did, when did you start driving? When was the next? Was <laughs> I was uh, I was actually a honor student in high school. Okay. Um, I I don't know how because I I skipped quite often or I'd be late because I'd be fishing, you know. And um, truthfully, I didn't, didn't like school. I mean, I couldn't wait to be done with it. And uh, my, I heard my grandpa tell my dad when I was maybe 12 or 13, he said, someday that kid's going to make a living fishing. And, of course, in those days, that was a guide. Yep. Nobody, you know, or a commercial fisherman, yep. but a, primarily a guide. And uh, and I thought, cool. So there, there I had I had a goal, right? <laughs> an idea. And uh And that was my goal. It, things happen, you know. Uh, I, I went to college for a year. I really didn't like it. Uh and I dropped out and I got drafted. That was during the Vietnam War. So I got drafted, spent two years in the Army, uh, came out. And uh, so I lost those yep. years and uh, and then made a whole lot of mistakes, which you do at that age. Yep. Uh, don't need to go into any of that, but uh, stayed out of jail. That's except, a good one. Except for one night. <laughs> and, 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 we all need and, that reminder, yeah, though, yeah, I think. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's why I've never been back. And and But anyway, uh, I met a girl. We got married. Had a bunch of kids. And you do that, and you have responsibilities. Yep. And so, so you have to set your agenda on hold for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and I had to do that. Uh, so I was doing some guiding. I was able to do that through those years lots of outdoor writing okay uh uh 
were which was good because I met every sponsor because mm-hmm. they they like outdoor writers yep. <laughs> and uh and a lot of the professional anglers who are out there especially in the bass field mm-hmm. uh and then skip ahead of that all of a sudden the, there was a walleye tournament circuit called the uh manufacturers walleye council mwc <laughs> yep. which became the masters walleye circuit uh i watched that for a couple of years wrote about it wrote about guys that fished it there was a young kid fishing by the name of gary parsons and uh, I ended up fishing with him uh, and doing a story. And then a year later, I was fishing against him in the, the <laughs> in, in my first MWC tournament. So, so, so what got you into outdoor writing? What was it? Just because you couldn't didn't have time, you had to make a living somehow, or or how? Why? What got you into doing doing that? Um, I like to write. I, I hadn't written anything in ten years since since college, and uh, there was an outdoor publication looking for writers. So I. Thought, eh. I try that. I, I kind of like to write, mm-hmm. so I started writing, and they were paying me. Uh, eventually, I was making a living as a freelance writer. It took uh, about three years, okay. uh, and I did that for ten years. And but you hit a, you hit the wall. I mean, you hit a threshold. Yep. You can only write so much, mm-hmm. and uh, and until it, suddenly the fun's gone. It's a job. I didn't like jobs, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> when, it, us like jobs. when it became a job, I went. I think I'd rather be a professional walleye angler. So, uh, and I'd been fishing bass tournaments. I had a lot of success at that, and thought, well, I'll try. I know how to catch walleyes. Fished uh, my first walleye tournament and won it. And I fished another one and won that one. Uh, they were smaller. T- well, one was the national walleye ter- uh, championship tournament. Uh, in 88 and uh, I thought well okay maybe I can actually do this you know Uh, but then I'm in the MWC and I got Mike McClellan and Bob Props in the boat over here and Gary Roach and Randy uh, Randy Emmonrud over there and I'm like what am I doing I am so (laughs) over my head (laughs) you know Uh, but cast a check me and my partner Scott Hill and we almost won team of the year that year Uh, Keith and Gary did win it Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was at the beginning of the whole walleye thing, and it, and it was uh, it was it was fun. Right. It was fun, and and they have those and, you know those guys. They could be two things: your friend or your foe. Uh, when you're fishing against them, they're your foe. Yep. But they're not your foe when you're standing together talking and yep. you're eating together and you're doing these other things. They're they're friends mm-hmm. primarily. So uh, it was great. I mean, it was just. Uh, how life goes sometimes right so what was what would trigger you to write a story would it be your fish your personal adventures or just something you saw it's me wanted to kind of figure out more so you dived a little depth into it yeah i, I did a lot of hunting back then so I, I wrote a lot of personal hunting stories uh you know for various publications which mainly were small or regional but then uh I started doing sending some stuff to like outdoor life, field and stream, sports and field, and they they didn't buy everything, but that was okay because what they didn't buy I could sell to Fin and Feather magazine mm-hmm. or Badger Sportsman or, or some other other that would pay less but it would still pay mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and and then those days they paid well and and for photographs, way better than today. Right. So thought, what, what were you getting back then? I was getting five hundred dollars for a feature article in a in regional publications, which wow. is nuts. I mean, you can't right. even come close to that today. No. Uh, how you know? I mean, it's just the mm-hmm. way things were, and 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 I. The problem is, if you only write twelve of those, because you one every month, <laughs> yeah. Then you have to have you got to be writing for somebody else, yeah. Too. So and, and you have conflict of interest clauses and stuff. Mm-hmm. Even though you're a freelancer, yep. I mean, you can't run that article in one magazine and run it in another one once you, you know, run it that article's yeah, done yeah, pretty yeah, much it, it's done so <laughs> i mean you can do rewrites and you know shorten stuff up for other yep. publications and they're okay with that but but you, you know you have to be sensitive to that as mm-hmm. well so when did writing go to you decide that i'm gonna you still always write though right you still Oh, even when you started fishing professionally, or you still you were still writing. Well, I was writing books then. I switched yep. from from primarily from articles to books, uh, for a reason. 
uh, I'm a professional walleye angler. I need writers to write about me. Hmm. If I'm writing stories, um, I'm taking money out of their pocket. That makes sense. Okay. So then I would contact contact the writers, say, yeah, I got this idea for a story. And uh, I said, say, oh, man, that's great. Have you, <laughs> have you done this before? No. Uh, have you worked with anybody else before? No. So guys like Dave Mull, Mark Strand, uh, uh, Tim Lesmeister, many and many, many, many others that that I worked with, uh, Ken Schultz from from uh, uh, Sports Field and so on. Well, now all of a sudden, you got their ear, so they would call. Eventually, they started calling me. Okay, I'm yeah. doing this piece. I'm doing this piece. Have you ever fished here? No, but I'd like to. Well, let's meet. <laughs> Right. So I'd drive to New York and fish with Ken Schultz on Lake Chautauqua, you wow. know, and, and then he'd do a feature story, yep. um, which helps your sponsors yep. and, and puts, so puts on. Puts out there. So, so it's... it's uh, that was like old school social media. It's old school social <laughs> media. And, 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 and so I, I gradually got away from that, but then I still wanted to write. So I, I, I wrote uh, In Fisherman did a series of, of walleye books, uh, and I did one of those. And uh, jigging walleyes A to Z, <laughs> and and, uh, and then I, I did Journal of a Walleye Pro, which was my personal yep. uh, uh, experiences on the walleye trail, and wrote a, and then I wrote a few others after that. So some his, history book. I'm really into history, so I started yep. writing some historical stuff as well. Yep. So when you're way back in in Montello. And you're, you hear your grandpa say that you're going to be a fisherman. What, what did that mean to you? Did you, did you put a goal in mind back in your head that, hey, I'm going to find a way to get there? Or, You know, I thought my grandpa was the greatest fisherman ever in my eyes, right? And he was really good. If he thought I was that good... That that really meant something to me, and and, and I never, I've, obviously, I've never forgotten him saying yeah. that. I think about it a lot, and um, you know that that's kind of the incentive that pushes you to to do better. And one of the things that that happens in fishing is, is a lot of people they they become so species oriented that they forget there's other fish out there too. Yeah. And I will fish for anything. Mm -hmm. I just like fishing. Um, and the reality is, uh, walleyes, as much as I like to catch them, were, were never actually my favorite, I shouldn't say never my favorite fish. They got to be my favorite fish when I was getting paid a lot of money to catch them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but bass for me, okay. uh, and, and as a kid, it was crappies, catfish, and carp. That's, mm -hmm. those are kids' bullheads. Yep. Those are kids' fish. You know, that's and maybe some bluegills, you yep. know. Especially on the growing up on the river, uh, exactly. I mean, you know, so, but in fishing all those different species, you learn so many many idiosyncrasies about fish in general. When you become a pro, you're light years ahead of people wow. that only fish a certain species yep. of fish, right. and including walleyes. Yeah, you, know, you can get so hung up on that and so focused on on that one species of fish that it doesn't make you better at catching them hmm. at all because you, you get you get in a rut. Right, yep. You have no new things coming into your exactly. brain to help you out. Exactly. So you fished the Fox River. Did you, when did you guys, or did you, when you did, what did you expand to other things? Green Lake's right there, Puckway's right there. What about well, any of those experiences? Well, when I got a when, when I got my, my uh, guide boat, I started guiding primarily on Lake Puckaway. Uh, in those days, those days, uh, fishing, it was hard to locate walleyes. It was tough. It, this is, I'm talking pre planer board days, yep. uh, all of that. So, so you had to find these little tiny spots where, where these fish would hang out. And one of the things I learned, which really helped in, in tournament fishing, is that walleyes aren't always on rocks in 15 feet of water. Okay. <laughs> Maybe There's in other stuff out there you're saying? Maybe in Minnesota, <laughs> but, but, okay, uh, Minnesota, there's a lot of people still think that, but, um, of course, they think they're going to the Super Bowl, too. That's true. So. That's, but anyway, that's, true. Uh, that's a whole other thing. Um, I would catch walleyes on a 90-degree day in a foot and a half of water. Okay, so why? 
Right. So, so that's the next thing. You got to figure that out. Why are they there? And once you put that whole thing together, when I, I never fished Bago in my life till I fished a tournament and almost won the tournament because I was a shallow water fisherman. Uh, Bago was dirty back then, mm -hmm. stained, dirty yep. water. Fish, there were millions of fish in a foot of water, a foot and a half of water. They were under boat docks or yep. they're up shallow, and people weren't, not many people were fishing those fish. Right. Uh, same thing happened at other bodies of water when we tournament fished. All the boats are in the middle of the lake fishing deep rocks, yep. and me and Scott, we're up on the shoreline beating the shore <laughs> to death, catching these giant walleyes in you know, one to three feet of water. So, so there again, I learned that when I was a kid, but I really learned it once I got a boat and could get out, get out and expand uh, uh, so, my area. So Puckaway is pretty uh, weedy now. Was it weedy back when, yes. you were, when you were there? There, there were zero weeds in that lake. Really? Even five years ago, basically. I mean, it was so now it's pretty. It's pretty. Yeah, you got a little limited time to be out there and work, and then after that, it's pretty much. It's not a lot of not a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, a lot a lot of people are really unhappy with that. It's kind of how things go. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, a couple of drought years in a row, uh, less carp, cleaner water, mm -hmm. sunlight penetration. You got a, a seed bank that's been there for hundreds of years, and bam, you know, and, yep. it, it, and it happened really quick. It did. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of that, we had, we had a lot of heavy uh, uh, infiltration of silt from the flood years. Yep. Uh, uh, six, seven years ago, 10 years ago, we had some serious floods. So all that silt came out of Buffalo Lake, other places, washed in the puck away. Now, there were no weeds to hold it, but it was still there. Yep. There was a seven-foot hole there. I always fish. It's two and a half feet deep right now, and that's silt. I yep. mean, it just filled it up. So you go from a sand-bottom lake to a wow. silt-bottom yep. lake, all those nutrients and those weeds just explode. Right. Now, maybe another flood year will take, stuff away. Will take some of it away. <laughs> Probably so, not all of so it. So what do you feel about when, when we have these – these bodies of water that are changing and people want to come in and, and if it's cut the weeds, I know that's a, a, a button issue out there. They want to, you know, people that buy their, these nice places, these nice places want, you know, their docks back and want to cut weeds. Well, sure. And I, and I, I totally understand that. I mean, if I, if I was a shoreline owner and wanted to stay there and not sell out and go fish, you know, go find yep. a, a, a nicer, maybe I shouldn't say nicer, but cleaner lake. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be able to get out my boat out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Buffalo Lake people have learned to live with it. Yep. And uh, and the lake is, I, I just fished it the other day. The lake's phenomenal. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just full of fish and good fish. Yep. Whether Puckaway will sustain their walleye thing with all the weeds, I don't know. That remains to be seen. Yep. They tend to not like to be weed choked. Mm -hmm. Um but it's Puckaway will become probably the best bass lake in the state of Wisconsin, and uh, and there's giant pike in there. There's giant pike in there. I actually, grew, I grew, well, that's one of the places I grew up fishing as a kid. Is my okay. dad always take us over there ice fishing and stuff, and yeah, uh, and do a little bit of fishing during the summertime. So I know the area well, and it's actually I hunt just right down the road, so I spend a lot of time out there. Okay. Yet, so I'm like, okay. I always I always wonder how it was like back in the day. I mean, when I was a kid, it was good. It was deeper and. Northerns were plentiful and they always were big and right. uh, and walleye walleye fishing was was really good. Yeah, and it's and it still is. I mean, there's still a yep. lot of fish in there. Uh, and and I guess we will just have to see how things go. I mean, there's there's a lot of things they can do to 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 t make it tolerable. Yep. And it won't be tolerable for everyone. Yep. You know, the, the people true. who want no weeds that ain't ever yep. going to happen. And uh, and no one wants it we joked right so yeah. i mean the fishermen don't want it that way either so no. and it's yeah. the thing i think we're gonna have to get used to in general right i mean like uh winnebago you know, is, is clean is clearing up so there's as that clears like, up the weeds are gonna start growing from deeper and deeper oh, and absolutely it's gonna change how we fished in 10 years that lake's gonna be com completely different it will be and it's changed dramatically from uh the, my, my tournament days when when you couldn't find a weed bed out there <laughs> and if you did there were 100 walleyes in it you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so um when you what do you think growing up 
what think what do you think that you know, what made you want to really fish every day was there a thing that kept bringing you back every day was it the the feel in the fish um bite it was it just figuring out what was going on what kind of really made it like you know get right into you that you're going to be a fisherman through and through right yeah I, and i think all of the above i mean I, I really enjoyed being in nature and i really enjoyed being alone and quiet mm-hmm. um I, my family's loud. I, I, I have a loud family. Okay, seven kids. That's and that's uh, and, uh, and I, I just never dealt with that really well. And so I had no problem. I could sit on the bank of a river, or sit out in a boat, you know, fourteen hours, and think nothing of it. You know, it'd go by so fast. And uh, when you do that, if you're not catching fish. I was always this way. I'm still that way. If I'm not catching fish, I need to figure out why. Okay. You know, in the old days, you rode out, dropped the anchor, you fished. If you caught mm-hmm. fish, they were biting. If you didn't, they weren't biting. Okay. Yep. Uh, not understanding that, well, maybe there were none there. Yep. <laughs> you know? right. and, uh, uh, and so, and, and I'm still that way. If I'm fishing and not catching fish, I'm like, okay, something's going on here. Either I need to adjust or I need to move, yep. and uh, and I know this is a great spot. Not today with it, you know all the electronics we got that that takes a lot of guesswork out of it. Mm-hmm. But 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 still, you still got to catch them. Yep. I tell everybody that you still have to catch them, yep. and it's it's no different than deer hunting or anything else. You're gonna have that deer on your every trail camera underneath every tree, every mm-hmm. place you got a bow stand. But you still got to shoot the deer. Yep. And, and how many videos have we watched where guys shoot over the back of the deer <laughs> because yep. they're too excited? Yep, well, like a leap. you can do that same thing fishing yep. too, yeah, easily. So fast forward. So now you um, now you're fishing professionally. Uh, what made you just dive right in? Was it confidence in your first couple of tournament? Well, well def- definitely confidence. I. Um, I didn't know a lot about walleye fishing beyond this area where, where I where I learned. Okay, so when I went to Malax Lake, for example, I'm like, whoa, this is one big lake, right. and it's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spots on it that that would hold walleyes, and I never fished a slip bobber in my life, and I never really. Fish, I fished Lindy rigs a little bit, but not much. And, and and all the things that they were doing there to catch walleyes. So the first time I get there, I was lost, but I still did well because mm-hmm. I was pitching jigs on top of reefs. <laughs> well, hey, you know, you do that in right. Winnebago, oh, you know. And yep. So it's stuff that I already knew. But I wanted to learn the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I went to Lake Oahe in South Dakota, bottom bouncers and spinners. Okay, never fished, never even seen one, never even heard of one. Right. And guys are bringing in an average of seven, eight pounds fish, and I'm catching three pounders casting jigs. <laughs> now that is that's not going to work. Yep. Uh, that it's great for fun and food, fishing for fun and food, but right. in tournament competition, no. So having to learn all these things that that work in, ge- in, in geographically, and then bring them back and try them Here. where no one's ever fished them before, right. um, and that arsenal is. Yeah, there's six, seven ways to yep. catch them. I mean, there's not a thousand ways to catch yeah, fish. Right. There's very few ways to catch fish. You just, they're, they're just all been tweaked, you yep. know. And, That's true. And, and it's all about, it's all about the presentation. Uh, a lot of times you can have like the worst lure in the world on there, but if you're presenting it very well, you will catch some fish on it. So uh, I wanted to learn all this stuff. Yeah, this was so new. This is like, like a kid in a candy store. I wanted to taste it all, and I was able to do that. And I was, and I was able to do it well enough to win some money doing it, mm-hmm. and and even win some tournaments doing something I had never even considered doing. Trolling planer boards, you know. I mean, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, what are those guys? What are they dragging through the water? You know, uh, trolling in general. Yep. What I, was the hardest thing for you to learn? For you to pick up? Yeah, but that's a. I think that would be it. Uh, that and lead core, mm. trolling lead core line. 
um, without having a mentor, just having somebody say, well, here's what you do. Yep. Um, but had I been able, to, had I gotten in boats with guys like Ron Seelhoff, for example, or Bob Props, who did a lot of it that could have showed me Yep. It, it would have give you the tricks. Uh, my learning curve would have been yeah. a lot shorter. Than, uh, it took me years to kind of. Right. Take... I couldn't imagine if, if somebody jumped and said, "Here's some boards never did before." It's you know it can really without a couple baseline ideas, it can really be a pain. The first time I did it was on one of Bagel with, with my partner, my tournament partner. We put the boards on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> they ran into each other. They're coming at us. You know, <laughs> we, we were laughing so hard. And we're looking. Uh, we're bad at this. We shouldn't right. be doing this. Even figure out how to bring them in is, you but, know, a yeah, whole science. All of that, and but after a while, and then you get the confidence, and mm -hmm. you know, you're covering a ton of water. Yep. I mean, you, you can change base, you present, you know, change line lengths, and just all the things you do. Put snap weight fishing, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, dive dive planers. I mean, just so many different ways of presenting these baits for deeper fish, but also. How about planer boards in three feet of water? Yep. If you're going there with a boat, mm -hmm. you know the fish are there, you'll spook them out. So yep. you run a planer board. Way up in there. Um, 10 feet behind the board, and mm -hmm. the board flies out of water. <laughs> and it's fun. I mean, it's, yep, you know, it they say, oh, that's, I don't like fishing like that. Well, I do because I catch fish doing it. Yep. That's, that's, and if you catch fish, you got to like it. Right. For the full version of this podcast, check out Fix TV. And remember, follow me on the talk at Smile and Fish and everywhere else at Matt Snell.